Major funding for NJTV News is provided in part by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Tonight on NJTV News, the race to the electoral finish line. Governor Murphy barnstorms the state in advance of tomorrow's assembly election. Newark residents picked up free bottled water donated by a Texas charity. Many people in this town are still worried about lead in their drinking water. Plus, can hospitals help reduce opioid addiction by reducing opioid prescriptions in the ER and exploring the legacy of slavery that for 400 years has framed America? Those stories and more next on NJTV News. Live from the Agnes Barris NJTV studio at 2 Gateway Center in Newark, this is NJTV News with Mary Alice Williams. Hello, thank you for joining us on air and online. Tomorrow's the day New Jersey voters decide who will represent them in Trenton. A single South Jersey state Senate seat is on the ballot, and all 80 assembly seats are up for grabs. Republicans want to put a check on the Democrats' dominance. That party currently controls the governor's office and both houses of the legislature, and Governor Murphy ran a weekend marathon in hopes of keeping it that way. Chief political correspondent Michael Aaron has our report. Governor Murphy hit the hustings this weekend. So did his wife, First Lady Tammy Murphy. Between the two of them, by tonight, they will have done 40 campaign stops over four days. Murphy says in a low turnout election like tomorrow's, where the assembly tops the ticket, you never know who's going to actually come out and vote. A lot of my energy and my wife's and our colleagues' energy has been devoted at getting people fired up to get out there and vote tomorrow. Are they fired up, we ask? Listen, in the rooms and places I've been in, they they feel fired up. I have to say, I was in Bridgewater yesterday. We had a, a room full of energy. Um, some of you were there. I was in at the Westfield train station, fired up. Uh, uh, was at a big breakfast in Fairview in Bergen County yesterday, six or 700 people. Um, so we'll see. That's why they play the game. That this is the night before the game, and we're going to find we're going to know a lot more uh, uh, tomorrow night than we know today. Four districts are considered most in play: districts one, eight, twenty-one, and twenty-five. The marquee race is in twenty-one in Union, Morris, and Somerset counties. That's where Republican Minority Leader John Bramnick and his running mate Nancy Munoz are being challenged by Democrats Lisa Mandelblatt and Stacey Gunderman. Two conservative Republicans are also on the ballot as third-party independents and could siphon votes away from the moderate Republican incumbents. Bramnick said this weekend the Democrats didn't want Murphy in their district. It's my opponents who won't take a picture with him because they know in my district, which is a reasonably moderate district, that he's far to the left. But here they all are at the Westfield train station yesterday with Congressman Tom Malinowski. The state Republican Party has called tomorrow's election the Murphy midterm and a referendum on his first two years. The governor said today he's OK with that. It's certainly at least partly a referendum, and we welcome that because we like where we're headed. Uh, we inherited uh, a mess. Uh, we, we said we would stand for a stronger and fairer New Jersey that works for everybody, that we would be for the middle class, the working families, the folks like I was growing up who looked up hoping someday to get into the middle class. And I think we have done what we said we would do, investing in education uh, by example of today. We will fix NJ Transit if it kills me, which it might. I hope not in this, uh, at this moment. Monmouth University pollster Patrick Murray thinks Murphy is not a big factor in the election. Phil Murphy probably neither helps nor hurts the cause at, the, at this point. Um, you know, uh, there are other entities that are much more important right now in voters' minds. That includes uh, the current president, Donald Trump, and also includes the former governor, uh, Chris Christie. Uh, even though we're a couple years removed from him as governor, uh, he still has a significant impact on how uh, the Republican brand is seen here in New Jersey. Party control is not at stake. The Democrats currently enjoy a 54 to 26 majority. 
The wild card is the voters. Tomorrow, just by the configuration of the ballot, is typically a low turnout election. So your vote always counts, but tomorrow counts even a little bit more. Last week, there was some question whether the governor would campaign at all for Democratic candidates in tight races. That question has been answered. How much good it will have done remains to be seen. In Bridgewater, I'm Michael Aaron, NJTV News. The last time assembly races topped the ballot four years ago, just 22 percent of those registered cast ballots. This year, we're watching two potential game changers. Electoral engagement, 73 percent more voters turned out in June's primary compared to 2015. Also, mail-in ballots intended to make casting ballots more convenient. The Department of State says as of last Tuesday, more than 200,000 votes had already been mailed in. NJ Spotlight's Colleen O'Day has been following the big money races. Colleen, what are you watching? Uh, we're looking at races down in South Jersey and Cape May County and Atlantic County, uh, Burlington County. We're looking at Morris County and in particular at the Union County based race involving John Bramnick, who is the assembly minority leader, the Republican leader in the assembly, and he's facing uh, challenges both from Democrats and from independent conservatives. Colleen, school spending is also on a number of ballots, right? Oh, definitely, yes. There's uh, 10 districts have questions to do construction work, uh, totaling $240 million. The biggest one of those is in Palisades Park in Bergen County. That's worth about $61 million. Okay, thank you, Colleen. And are you signed up for Spotlight's daily newsletter? Go to njspotlight.com and click on Newsletters. And tomorrow, NJ decides. Polls across the state will open from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. Once polls close, you can head to njtvelectionnight.org for the most updated results. And at 11 o'clock, NJTV News will bring you full election coverage, including live updates from key races around the state. The city of Newark is fast-tracking the process of replacing some 18,000 old service lines leaching lead into the water supply. But Newark's water crisis is also a crisis of confidence. Senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan spoke with some neighbors. They're picking and choosing who they want to give water to. At least that's how I feel. Cassandra Pullen claims Newark won't give her a lead filter or bottled water. She's pregnant, lives with two little kids in an apartment building, and she's worried about lead in the drinking water there. So she stopped to pick up some free bottled water at Paradise Baptist Church today from six pallets donated by a Texas charity. That even though Newark officials say apartment buildings like hers don't have the local lead service lines that have been corroding and contaminating the city's water. I don't think that's true. And it doesn't make me feel safe just because they feel like we're okay. My building is old. It's been up for a while, so I'm pretty sure the piping is old. Nobody's redid any piping or anything like that. A steady stream of residents lined up for water at the church. Several said they got turned down by the city when they asked for lead filters and water. Did you have the water tested for lead? Um, they told me my area was good. But evidently it's still not good. You don't trust? I don't trust the water still. Newark stopped distributing free water in early October after city officials reported tests of pure filters conducted with the EPA proved they worked in 97 percent of samples. The filters Newark distributed are intended to protect impacted residents while the city implements a new corrosion control treatment. It's working on a long-term solution to replace all lead service lines within two years with a $120 million loan from Essex County. County. It's done 2,000 lines so far, but all this follows months of mixed and sometimes inaccurate messaging, critics claim. Many people, frankly, don't trust the water right now and are insisting on using bottled water. And I think once that trust is broken, it's hard to regain it. Eric Olson's with the Natural Resources Defense Council, which sued Newark over lead contamination and filed another complaint October 25th, requesting independent oversight of the city's lead testing protocols and more transparency. This complaint seeks information on the EPA lead filter tests, which haven't been released. The city is saying that the water filters work 97 to 99 percent of the time, but they haven't been willing to share that data publicly. And not enough uh, testing is being done in our area where they said we were non-impacted because we do not have lead service lines. 
Lisa Parker lives on Boston Street. Private lead tests at her house showed 41 parts per billion within the past month, almost three times the 15 parts per billion federal action level. Her son bought filters for her faucets because she says the city wouldn't. And despite a new million dollar door to door assistance program, the filters still confuse some folks. But I never put it on. I, I, I... Do you know how to put it on? Somebody's going to show me. I got to have somebody show me. Even with the filter system, they're saying, look, uh, when you get up in the morning, turn it on, let it run for 10 minutes, and then the filter should start working. The city claims Newark's response to our lead situation is unprecedented, and we wish people would stick to the facts instead of trying to fuel hysteria for their own self serving aggrandizement. No major city has ever undertaken such a task with such expedience and will complete it so quickly. That is the real story here. Meanwhile, the charity plans to deliver another six pallets of water soon. Paradise Baptist has handed out 60,000 cases already ready, these should be gone in a day. In Newark, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJTV News. Though the state's not on track to top last year's all-time high 3,163 deaths due to overdose, New Jersey's opioid epidemic is still taking a deadly toll. By the end of September, the state attorney general's office recorded 2,166 had died. Now some hospitals are looking at their own emergency departments as the front line to limit opioid addiction. Leah Mishkin reports. We know that any prescription written for opioids could serve as a gateway to addiction. Doctors, nurses, and pharmacists from hospital emergency departments across the state came together for a training on how to reduce opioid prescribing. It's part of a new state initiative called Opioid Reduction Options Program, or ORO, funded by the New Jersey Department of Health and New Jersey Department of Human Services. The state is providing $1 million for this program. In this cohort, there are 11 hospitals participating in the year-long program, and they'll get technical assistance and more training like the one here today. I think a lot of physicians and clinicians are thinking about it. They're just not sure what's out there or how to do it. So what we're doing is we're trying to take that information, disseminate it down into quick and easy protocols that have been vetted, that are research-based. Pain management and addiction medicine chief Alexis Lapietra and her team at St. Joseph's Health have been national pioneers in reducing opioid prescribing with their program Alto, the Alternatives to Opioids program, which launched in 2016. It it uses a combination of medications to treat pain. Opioids are only used as a second option. So if we give one tablet of oxycodone, it masks pain. But if we give anti-inflammatories with acetaminophen, with small injections, with stretching, with patches, we get, we get a little bit of pain relief with each one and then combining them together, we get a really targeted actual treatment of the cause of pain. We were able to get an 82% reduction in our opioid use. St. Joe's serves as our gold uh, technical partner. In October of last year, President Trump signed a bill into law that appropriated money for grant funding so hospitals across the country could train nurses and physicians to build programs like Alto. We know that these programs do have a cost to them, but we know that the benefit is robust. So we'd like President Trump wanted to at least provide that funding as the grassroots effort to get participants and departments on board where they would otherwise be motivated but have the lack of funding to really implement the strategies. And we're not sure when the appropriations will come out. We're not sure what the funding will be. So the state decided, no, we're going to do this right here and we're going to do it ourselves and own it. New Jersey's made some progress in reducing opioid prescribing. From 2012 to 2018, we have actually seen approximately a 21% uh, percent decrease and opioid uh, prescribing among providers. At the same time, part of the Alto program aims to get addicted people into recovery. What matters is who you hand off to in the community and their capacity and their ability to be able to follow up on the things that you have initiated. The state agencies hope Oro will reduce overall opioid prescribing in hospital emergency departments to 12 percent. The national average is 17. In Princeton, Leah Mishkin, NJTV News. President Trump's taxes top tonight's business news. Here with that and more is Rhonda Schaffler. Rhonda. Mary Alice, President Donald Trump has lost his bid to keep his tax returns from being turned over 
to criminal investigators in New York. An appeals court ruled the president's accounting firm should comply with a subpoena from the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, which seeks eight years of tax returns as part of a broad investigation. The president's attorney has claimed the investigation is politically motivated and that the decision will now be appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. There's been no response yet from the Trump administration to a request made by several U.S. senators, including New Jersey's Cory Booker, to turn over documents related to the Federal Opportunity Zone program. That program provides developers with financial incentives to build in areas with an economic need. It's come under fire for potentially helping wealthy investors more than needy communities. And one recent news report alleged a Detroit businessman received Opportunity Zone tax breaks after making a donation to the Trump administration. The senators want officials to investigate possible political influence in the selection of areas benefiting from tax breaks. In New Jersey, there are Opportunity Zones in parts of 75 municipalities. The nation's sports betting industry is growing even faster than earlier predictions, and New Jersey is stealing the show. At a sports betting investor summit held in New York today, Morgan Stanley projected the U.S. market will generate about $7 billion in revenue by 2025. That's up from earlier estimates. Other participants at the conference had similar projections in terms of numbers, and those bettors like the Garden State. New Jersey has taken in more money from sports bets than Nevada in recent months. Two well-known consumer companies experienced stock losses today. Shares of clothing company Under Armour dropped 18%. On word of a federal investigation into its accounting practices and stock at McDonald's fell after its CEO was fired for having a consensual relationship with an employee. Overall, the stock market ending in new highs. The Dow rose 114 points. And those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by New Jersey Tourism Industry Association. Announcing the 2019 New Jersey Conference on Tourism, December 4th and 5th at Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City. More online at njtia.org. For nearly three years, many of New Jersey's municipalities have struggled to meet a state Supreme Court requirement to provide affordable housing for poor and middle class families whose needs have been ignored. But Edison Township has found an innovative way to increase the affordable housing supply. Joanna Gagas has the story. Crisis in Edison. More than 11,000 residents are waiting for access to affordable homes. One of the things that's happened in Edison and all throughout New Jersey is we really have a housing crisis and rents have gone up much faster than people's income. So the township launched a new program to provide affordable rental units called the Market to Affordable Rental Program. The township is providing a subsidy to any sort of landlord, um, $65,000 for a one bedroom unit and up to $105,000 for a two or three bedroom unit to deed restrict um, any one of their units as affordable for a moderate income household for the next 30 years. Dan Levin is senior planner for community grants, planning and housing run through the New Jersey Department of Community Affairs. It manages wait lists and certifies applicants for affordable housing across the state. Through this program, the deed restriction means the property must remain affordable for 30 years, even if it changes ownership during that time. The benefit to a market to affordable program, number one, is dispersal of units throughout the township. It allows um, Edison to make more affordable housing units across the township, whereas opposed to some of those other types of developments, it, it ends up with a concentration. Edison is required to have 115 affordable housing units. Levin says dispersing them allows residents to feel more a part of the community and students can attend schools they might not have access to if relegated to a different part of town. And there's a major cost savings through this model because it doesn't depend on building new construction. Because these units are already existing um, in existing buildings and throughout the township, it's less expensive um, and allows Edison as a result to provide additional housing trust fund dollars for other programs and other um, housing opportunities. Edison approved the market to affordable program back in 2016 with a $50,000 subsidy, but it didn't take off. Fair Share Housing Center's Adam Gordon said the money simply didn't match what landlords could earn for their properties. And the reality is that landlords are making a lot of money even on pretty modest apartments in places like Edison 
because there's such demand for uh, homes in, in most of the state. The latest data shows a quarter of Edison households earn half of the median income, which means they bring in less than $50,000 a year. And for those in need of affordable housing, they're waiting to be selected through a lottery system. As you can imagine with 11,000 people waiting for a home in Edison, once someone actually gets that chance, uh, they tend to hold on to it. And they tend to be good tenants with deep roots in the community, according to both Levin and Gordon. But perhaps to minimize any negative reaction from the community, the township is touting the fact that this program comes at no cost to the taxpayer. A percentage of residential, commercial, or industrial developments um, pay into the Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Uh, and then the Affordable Housing Trust Fund dollars are used to subsidize the landlords through this program. So far, about a sixth of the town's landlords have expressed interest, a major improvement from the last rollout. The goal is to fill the 115-unit obligation by 2025 with benchmarks of around 25 units a year. In the newsroom, Joanna Gagas, NJTV News. That wicked weather wreaking havoc on Halloween night in Morris County was, in fact, a tornado. The National Weather Service confirms an EF1 packing winds gusting up to 100 miles an hour, touched down in Harding Township and traveled nearly five miles, leaving a path of downed trees, crushed cars, and some property damage, and plunging close to a quarter of all homes in Madison into darkness. It is the ninth tornado to hit the state this year. Last year, there were none. One hundred fifty six years ago this month, Abraham Lincoln called America a nation conceived in liberty. But four hundred years ago this month, it began to be built on slavery. The New Jersey Institute for Social Justice co-hosted a program with Newark's Weequayock High School on the legacy of that original sin. Michael Hill was there. It's heavy. It's hard. I cried a lot making this project. It is not an easy history. But we have to confront the truth. That's what New York Times Magazine staff writer Nicole Hannah-Jones said the 1619 Project does. Hannah-Jones told the sold-out NJPAC audience the project marks the 400 years since the White Lion brought the first Africans to Virginia in a trade for supplies, the beginning of the buying and selling of stolen humans to serve and work as slaves in America. Hannah-Jones said the bodies of enslaved people became America's most valuable asset, producing two-thirds of the world's so whenever I have a white American tell me my ancestors didn't own slaves, we were from the north. Well, that poor white ancestor who made a living, a wage in that factory, using, spinning that enslaved grown cotton into cloth, was making a living off of enslaved people. We need to understand that this was a national venture. Hannah Jones was born in 1976, eight years after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and the passage of the 1968 Civil Rights Act. I am in the first generation of black Americans in the history of this country who was born into a country with full legal citizenship rights. So when we want to understand why we still struggle, it is because this history is recent. The project says look across all across American life in almost anything you can study, and we will show you how it links back to slavery. New Jersey advocates link it to statistics. In a lawsuit, the founder of Rutgers The Inclusion Project, Elise Body, said state residency rules help make New Jersey's schools the sixth most segregated in America. Separation is a tool of white supremacy, and what it does, what separation does, is it allows us to tell stories about the other, mm -hmm. right? It breeds fear. It breeds distrust. The New Jersey Institute for Social Justice links the vestiges of slavery to the state's wide black-white wealth gap. Next week, the Institute will urge lawmakers to confront the state's role in slavery and... To build a system of repair to address the enduring legacy of slavery as it manifested itself in New Jersey in the beginning and in the current moment. Hannah Jones was more blunt on reparations there is a restitution that is owed. Mm -hmm. And that restitution needs to be in the form of a check. Mm. Takeaways for the audience? A greater conversation in this country needs to be had about enslavement. If we just think about education and health care, right? Those are two institutions that really tell the sustainability of any society. One, the United States is the worst of all other industrialized nations. Why is that? 
The organizers of this lecture say they hope it sparks a discussion about what has taken place, what is taking place, and righting those wrongs. Truths that will make some people uncomfortable, Nicole Hannah-Jones says, and she says if it does, she knows she will have done her job. At NJPAC, Michael Hill, NJTV News. NJTV News is Decision Day here in New Jersey, and our teams will be fanned out covering your vote. Remember, polls open at 6 a.m. To share any story you've seen tonight, go to njtvnews.org. I'm Mary Alice Williams. For all the men and women of NJTV News, thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. PSE&G, we make things work for communities. And Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, an independent licensee of the Blue Cross and Blue Shield Association. NJM Insurance Company has been serving New Jersey policyholders for more than 100 years. But just who are NJM's policyholders? They're the social service and nonprofit pioneers who lend a helping hand. Science and technology innovators. The men and women who provide our skilled labor. And our homegrown champions. The people who make our state a great place to call home. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered. I'm fighting cancer. I'm fighting cancer. I am fighting cancer. I fight every day. Every night. Every hour, every minute, and every, every second. second. RWJ Barnabas Health, together with the Rutgers Cancer Institute of New Jersey, brings the latest research, treatments, and clinical trials close to home. We're fighting cancer. And I'm not fighting alone. RWJ Barnabas Health. Let's beat cancer together.